Hey guys, Dave from Nerdarchy, for nerds, by nerds, hang out with this nerd. Nerdarchy is dead. And why on earth would you want to make magic suck in your D&D game? <music> Let me start this video by thanking our sponsor, Easy Roller Dice. Whether it's your first set of dice or your one millionth set of dice, Easy Roller Dice for all your dice rolling needs. Right now, they have a Kickstarter going on for these awesome freestanding faux leather pouches for your dice. There will be a link to that Kickstarter in the description, as well as a Gleam contest where you can win your very own set of gunmetal dice. We're giving away five of them. There will be five winners. So check out the contest, check out the Kickstarter, and go get yourself some Easy Roller dice. All right, so today we were, uh, we're going to talk about some some harsh ways to cast some spells. This was uh you know kind of brought on by a Facebook post that I had seen. A DM wanted to have magic in his world be a little bit rougher to, to do, a little bit harder to cast. And he developed this system that anytime you cast a spell, you had to essentially make a spell check. You know, you take your typical uh typical to hit for a spell attack and roll a d20. And if you did not roll over your, if you, did, if you did not roll your spell DC or higher, the spell failed. You didn't use the spell slot, but you wasted your action in the attempt. And you know, I was kind of getting some some feedback from people, you know, in the in the group. And I'm like, you know, that's an interesting thing to talk about is modifying the the rules to such a severity so i figured we discuss it you know talk about the good the bad the ugly if you're going to do something like this you need to have a specific reason for doing it and there should also be a benefit to doing it as well like if your fighter and your barbarian and your rogue and your monk and all these other characters perform the same yet your spell casters their magic is worse all of a sudden like why would anyone want to play those classes and apparently, you know, from what you from what you told me is people did, they were, and then they're upset because they they got neutered when they started dealing with the negative consequences. So the information that I had, the, the the premise was brought up during a session zero. So I'm like, all right, kudos, the DM's doing the right thing. The players bought in and said, all right, I'm okay with this. And then once they actually start seeing it during play, now it's like, oh well, I'm not really as thrilled about this because you know it's affecting the flow of the game it's affecting combat now i 100 percent agree with you that there that there should be some kind of you know balancing of the, the scales of oh you know magic is harder to do but it's going to have you know this extra effect maybe you know everything is automatically bumped up a level for any spell that that can have that kind of effect, and you know that that's part of it. He didn't go into any details that you know showed any of that stuff. I didn't see anything that that said, "Hey, here's specifically why I'm doing it." But I think if you were to create a world like a Dark Sun esque kind of thing where magic has been affected over the course of time, that okay, this is something that could be a premise for an entire world. But mechanically, I would want some some kind of thing to give the players who decide, yes, I'm going to go with, with this as a, as a concept. I played a game years ago that magic was considered bad. And anyone who w was, was actively learning it, not born to it, or, you know, given, you know, direct abilities by divine beings, they, they were frowned upon and considered, like, you're you're the devil. You're a bad guy. You're not you're not good. And I'm like, well, I want to play a wizard. This sounds like a challenge. Sorcerers were fine because they were born to it. Clerics, druids, they were fine because they were granted abilities. But book magic was just bad. So I didn't have any benefits, but I also didn't have any hindrances other than role playing. Here, this is a purely mechanical downside to doing it. Yeah, I mean, I've also done something like this in my Shattered Realm campaign. Early on, where it was considered like anyone who used arcane magic, they were, they 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 were brooking with devils and demons and things like that. And you know, it's kind of bad design to hamper you know just one class or one type of character in your game, unless you literally just don't want them in that game. So if you know, if I were to introduce a new rule like this and it and it would, in play it wasn't working, 
I would trash it. I would just get rid of it and be like, well, this is trash. You know, you guys are unhappy with it. And, you know, if if they're also not seeing the benefit of going up against spellcasters and having their spells fail as well, it, it may not be a thing. So, but that being said, we you know, the idea behind this video is to take a trash rule and make it viable and come up with some ideas that would make it better. Now, in that instance, I feel like they should have been given something like you said, perhaps you know, perhaps they cast the spells at higher slots, you know, or there's less of cost, or when they do arcane recovery, they get even more magic back than, than they would have normally something, you know, you give them something in my own campaign where it's like, Oh, they broke with demons and devils. And, you know, maybe, you know, for that, for being, you know, hampered, maybe I should have given them something like, yes, they absolutely do. And here's a closet for you. And here's an imp for you. And the, yeah, yeah. You're brooking with that one. The one you kind of like own as a familiar. You know, so you could do things like that or whatever would make sense in your campaign to kind of like bump up, bump them up. And you could also use something else. You could just say familiar and it's you actually just get a magical assistant because that's part of the spell casting in your world. And that would be like kind of a cool thing. It might step on the toes of the Warlock, Pack of the Chains a little bit. But then again, you might just be like, well, there's not really any need for that path. You know, you take the other boons instead. Right. Because you're going to get the familiar. Right. So looking at that, all right, we've we've gone ahead and we've we've balanced the scales on on a world aspect of okay, you can get something for the detriment. But let's take a look at the concept and say, all right, how can we how can we look at this? And how how can we use this system in another way? Now, let's think about that question for a second. In every game, maybe not every session, but in each iteration of D&D role-playing games. And when you have these classes, there are times when each class is going to shine and other times where they're not. The fighter who excels at combat and able to dish out a lot of damage and be able to take it Many times, and I'm not going to say all, but many times those characters are not skill heavy and therefore during the social interaction and in the exploration phase, they're not going to have the skills to really shine, but combat they do. Some of your spellcasters, they're going to they're shine in each of their own elements based off of what type of spells and skills they've wind up taking. Rogues absolutely are going to excel in exploration you know, looking for traps and being able to know things because, let's face it, rogues get the expertise. You've got so many skills to rely upon. So many times classes are, are lifted up on these pedestals in specific situations. And other times the pedestal is knocked out from their feet and they're dropped down to the bottom. So what if we were to insert that, let's remove the spe the pedestal and say, well, certain combats, you know, wiz wizards or spellcasters are going to be hampered. We already know that there are anti-magic zones that can, can be used either by spells or artifacts, areas that just occur naturally in your world. Magic just doesn't work at all. But what about areas that are somewhere in the middle? You know, what if we were to create either places, um, times based off of you know celestial alignment uh you know other circumstances that happen where this magic is affected or all magic is affected in this area and you have to really apply pressure you have to really try hard to make that spell go off and here's instances where you could use that rule set you could say all right this area is you know, we wouldn't call it a null magic zone, you know, but you'd come up with some kind of name. And here, magic doesn't doesn't work right. In these instances, boom, you're gonna have to make an attack roll against your own DC. So if you've got more challenge, more magic items that boost your DC, if you're really powerful, you're working against your own self to make the spells work. So it's a it's a cool balancing factor. You know, if you're not really all that great at magic then it's a little bit easier to make it happen. It's a weird mechanic. You know, you might want to, as opposed to using the spell DC that this DM, DM came up with, you might come up with a another rule based on the level of the spell you're trying to cast so that low-level magic is easier to cast than high. You know, so there's lots of different ways that you could look at it. 
Yeah, absolutely. And also, you know, you, you mentioned like places and circumstances. Style of play would be another one, which is kind of what this GM went for. Mm -hmm. And like style of play, there's a, there is one way you can do it where maybe you don't really change the core class other than this mechanic. And that is only the players have magic. It is so rare that you're going to encounter magic because there's a low magic world that yes, it is harder for your player to use his abilities or her abilities, but the chances are you're never going to have to uh, def defeat magic yourself. You know, it's going to be very rare. So your monsters are going to be non-magical in nature most of the time. And when you do encounter them, they're probably going to have to deal with the same things. Uh, so your adversaries, when you do use your magic and it works, then it's going to be, oh, you know, because, you know, that that may be it may be an intimidation factor where because they're not used to dealing with it, you know, enemy, you know, enemy ranks are just going to break because you just hit someone with a magic missile, you know, or a fireball because they've never seen a spell cast before. And you're clearly a powerful spell caster. You know, what would you do if you were walking down the street and someone modern day society, they spun their hand and fire leapt out of their hand and attacked and melt you know, at your someone. face. <laughs> and, and, and attack someone. It, it, you know, we're, we're squishy little humans. You know, a firebolt can do a D10. That could be enough to, you know, kill us little commoners. Um, so, absolutely. You melt the face of the guy, you know, in front of you. And how are you going to react to that one? And that that's what you could have in a low magic setting if you, you wind up going with this kind of thing. And not only that, too, you might do, like, first of all, I, you know, the DC system that he was using, I, didn't, I don't particularly care for. The idea of doing, like, DC 10 plus, or any number, really, but DC, DC 10 plus uh, level of the spell and making a check versus that with your, either your attack roll or an arcana check, you know, makes more sense to me. And then also, like, you could then reward the player, maybe with not mechanical benefits, but role-playing benefits, where it's like, oh, once people rise, you're a mage. They're actually afraid of you. Now, that can be worked to your benefit or to your disadvantage, depending, depending on the circumstances. Like, they might try to run you out of town. Or they may want to run you out of town, but they're too scared to run you out of town. You know, so there's definitely things like that that could happen. On the other side, they might be like, you know, I'll give you whatever you want. Just don't kill me. Like, yeah, they're, yeah. they're afraid. It's like, oh, keys to the city, all of my money, whatever have you. I just don't want to die. Please don't take my soul and give it to the demons. Yeah. You know? Now, we talked about places, like places where magic just doesn't really work the way you anticipate. You know, could be a wild magic zone. Could be, you know, just a, a, a magic's dampened there. Or maybe you're wearing manacles or a collar that dampens magic. And you have to work that much harder to do it. Or if, it's, if you're doing something fun, like, okay, you have to make a roll to do it. And you're in a chaos magic zone. You make the same checks that a, a sorcerer would for wild magic. You could do something like that to make it more interesting. And then we also talk about circumstances. Circumstances might be um, like the, I guess the collar and cuffs, that would be a circumstance. An astrological event that changes how magic works could be an event. Could be, it could go the other way. Like you could have to make that roll, not to see if the spell goes off, but to see if you can control your magic. You know, similar to a wild surge where extra effects happen or the power or your spell becomes empowered maybe past where you can control it. You know, you went to do a, a fireball, but instead it's like a fireball, a, a fireball or, or I almost, I'm almost thinking of like flame strike on, you know, on the horizontal instead of the vertical. So like there's, there's lots of, there's lots of ways to bend and twist this kind of idea and say, all right, how can I, how can I take this? How can I make it, you know, pop? How can I make it really useful without, you know, essentially, you know, mucking up the rules without making my PCs angry. And and this is just a, a handful of ways. I like the concept. I'd like to expand upon it, um, you know, because to me, just the idea of there's areas that is most of the world and you can cast magic regularly. And there's areas of no magic that, you know, can occasionally spring up. All right. Yeah, that that's OK. But to me, that's not enough. You know, what about areas of amplified magic as well as, you know, zones of magic dampening? Um, you know, there's there's ways to, to bend and twist, you know. An area where magic is amplified, you know, perhaps you could apply automatic, you know, uh, sorcerer 
effects to it that, oh, well, everything's twinned or everything's empowered or everything goes off at a, at a spell slot higher of, you know, first through fifth. Uh, you know, like you could do any of those kind of things and really start to shape your world into something cool and interesting, much more so than just your, you know, average, you know, campaign book. Yeah, Eberron had manifest zones that were linked to particular uh, planes of existence, particular worlds, and things would happen there and work differently. Shar in the City of Towers was one where uh, you could manifest air magic and flying magic and that kind of magic so much easier. And that's why they were able to build uh, towers so so large and so tall without them falling over. So you can incorporate that kind of stuff. And the trick, too, is if you're going to do something that hampers a particular player, you don't want to do it for more than an encounter or a session. And, you know, you could spread that love around. You know, a, a throne room scene where the mage is fully empowered and has access to all their stuff, but your rogue and your... And your fighters, they might not have their weapons. They might not have their armors because it's inappropriate. And you might have something happen where they have to then deal with the situation and they don't have their normal stuff. Like, doing that once in a while is fun. You know, you're doing the fish out of water and giving your players, you know, a new challenge. There's nothing wrong with that. But doing it all the time could be a dickish move. You discuss it beforehand, like this guy did, but it didn't work out. And if it doesn't work out, be willing to compromise and talk to your players and, and find some even ground to to you know, uh, stand on it so everyone has fun at the table. Absolutely. So what do you guys think? How would you use this idea in your world? Great place to continue that conversation down below. While you're down there, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And uh, don't forget to go down to that description where you can check out Easy Roller Dice, their Kickstarter, that contest we have going on. Oh, yeah. And by the way, we always put our promo code down there for a one-time 20% off. So until next time, stay, stay nerdy. nerdy.